Good afternoon and welcome to Mission Control Houston. NASA's television's live coverage of the launch of the International Space Station Expedition 36 crew members Karen Nyberg, Fyodor Yuchikin, and Luca Papatano. We're looking at a live view of the Soyuz rocket that'll take these three on a journey to the International Space Station right now. The rocket is currently sitting on its launch pad at site number one at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, some 1,200 miles southeast of Moscow. The rocket is currently fully fueled and ready for liftoff today at 3.31 p.m. Central Time, which equates to 2.31 a.m. Baikonur time Wednesday morning. So far, the weather in Baikonur is looking very good for a launch uh, in the wee hours there. This trio is about to begin a single-day Soyuz flight to the International Space Station, with docking scheduled just six hours after launch at 9.16 p.m. Central Time tonight, or 6.16 a.m. Moscow Time. And, of course, that equates to 8.16 a.m. at the Baikonur Cosmodrome on Wednesday. Once the Soyuz is docked to the Rosfit module, the crew will join the current station residents who are already on board, Commander Pavel Vinogradov and Flight Engineers Chris Cassidy and Alexander Mazurkin. Those three have been aboard the station since March 29, and they're scheduled to return home to Earth aboard Soyuz TMA-08M in mid-September. Here in Houston, the team in Mission Control will be monitoring tonight's launch and getting updates on the flight from their Russian counterparts. Uh, tonight's flight director is Royce Renfrew, who is in the process of uh, conducting a handover with his team. The spacecraft communicator, or CAPCOM, who will be talking with the crew on orbit is Kate Rubens, an astronaut. With uh, Renfrew on console right now is uh, Brian Smith, who is uh, uh, helping out uh, as he finishes up the Orbit 2 shift before handing over to the Orbit 3 shift that will carry this crew from launch to orbit. The two spaceflight veterans and one first-time flyers will be launching today aboard the Soyuz TMA-09M spacecraft to the International Space Station. NASA astronaut Karen Nyberg will be making her second trip into space today and her first aboard a Soyuz. Her first space flight to the International Space Station was five years ago aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery on shuttle mission STS-124. Then she operated a robotic arm to install the Japanese Kibo module onto the space station and relocate the Kibo logistics module to its permanent location atop the Japanese laboratory. Nyberg will be serving her upcoming five and a half months aboard the space station with another seasoned flyer. And that is veteran Russian cosmonaut Fyodor Yushikin, who will be making his fourth trip into space today. His first flight was aboard STS-112, uh, the shuttle Atlantis to the space station, a mission to install the Starboard-1 truss as part of station assembly work. His next space flight was aboard Soyuz TMA-10 in 2007 to the International Space Station. He spent six months aboard as commander of Expedition 15 and performed three spacewalks. Your chicken returned to the station three years later aboard Soyuz TMA-19 and served as flight engineer of Expeditions 24 and 25, adding another two spacewalks to his record. Yushikin will transition from Expedition 36 Flight Engineer to Expedition 37 Commander in September after the departure of Chris Cassidy, Pavel Vinogradov, and Alexander Mazurkin. Italian Air Force Major and European Space Agency astronaut Luca Parmitano will be making his first venture into space today. A test pilot with more than 2,000 hours of flying time, he's qualified on more than 20 different types of military aircraft, as has flown more than 40 different types of aircraft total. This mission launches under the call sign Olympus, chosen by your chicken to represent the mythological name of the tallest stone mountain in the solar system, and the similarities your chicken has noted in the endeavor of building the International Space Station. There's a look at the crew patch. Talisman uh, that you may see hanging over the commander's seat during the ascent is a small toy dog that was given to your chicken more than 30 years ago by his high school teacher as a wish for good luck. 
Both Yershikin's call sign and talisman are the same ones he used on his flight aboard Soyuz TMA-19 back in 2010. Right now we are standing by at uh, 55 minutes and 42 seconds to launch of this Soyuz spacecraft from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan on a single six-hour mission to the International Space Station. The Soyuz rocket that you see there on the launch pad stands 162 feet tall and weighs 680,000 pounds. Both the rocket and the spacecraft share the same name. Today's launch will be taking place from the Baikonur Cosmodrome launch pad number one, known as Gagarin's launch site, from where Yuri Gagarin launched in 1961, becoming the first human in space more than 52 years ago. Back now with a live view of the Soyuz on the launch pad in Baikonur. We are now just uh, 54 minutes and 50 seconds away from the launch, with liftoff remaining scheduled for 3.31 p.m. Central Time, 2.31 a.m. on the steppe of Kazakhstan near Baikonur. The Soyuz spacecraft that will carry the crew to the International Space Station was mated to its booster in Baikonur on Saturday. Here we have some footage that was recorded. The Soyuz rocket was transported by rail car to the launch pad shortly after sunrise on Sunday. Here's a look at that rail car. And the Soyuz then with its uh, lifted into the launch configuration at the launch pad. Soyuz spacecraft with its three crew members on board sits high above the three stages of the Soyuz booster, which uses kerosene and liquid oxygen as propellant. The first stage has four liquid engines strapped to the side of the core vehicle as we look at an animation of the Soyuz launch. Each will burn for about 1 minute 58 seconds before they drop away. The core engine of the first stage also serves as the second stage and continues to burn until the 4 minute 58 second mark into the flight. The core engine of the first stage also serves as the second stage and continues to burn until the 4 minute 58 second mark. The third stage has a single engine that will burn for about 4 minutes 2 seconds, shutting down at the 9 minute mark of the flight. At that point, the Soyuz will be in its preliminary orbit of 143 by 118 miles. The whole Soyuz spacecraft is 23 and a half feet long and weighs 15,650 pounds is comprised of three modules. The descent module, situated in the middle of the Soyuz vehicle, contains customized seats for the crew members during launch, entry, and landing and contains all the controls and displays necessary for the flight. It also contains light support systems, batteries for re-entry and landing, and the parachutes and soft landing rocket engines to slow the Soyuz just before touchdown when the Soyuz lands in Kazakhstan. There are eight hydrogen peroxide thrusters located on the middle on the module that are used to control the spacecraft orientation or attitude during the descent until parachute deployment. It also has a guidance navigation and control system to maneuver the vehicle during the descent phase of the mission. This descent module weighs 6,393 pounds with a habitable volume of 141 cubic feet. About 110 pounds of payload can be returned to Earth in this module, and the descent module is the only portion of the Soyuz that survives the return to Earth. 
The orbital module, meanwhile, at the top connects to the descent module via a pressurized hatch. It is where the crew has a small amount of room to move around during this first ever six hour flight to the station. Actually, it's the second first six hour flight to the station. It has a volume of 230 cubic feet with a docking mechanism, hatch, and rendezvous antennas located at the front end. The docking mechanism is used to dock with the space station, and the hatch allows entry into the orbiting complex. The rendezvous antennas are used by the automated docking system, which were used as radar, to maneuver toward the station for docking. This is also uh, contains a window in the module. The propulsion module houses the oxygen storage tanks, attitude control thrusters, avionics, and communications and control equipment. The propulsion portion of this module handles all orbital maneuvers, including those needed for the rendezvous with the station and the deorbit burn at the end of the spacecraft's mission. Before they're deployed, the two solar arrays are folded against the body of the propulsion module, which separates from the descent module after the deorbit burn, along with the orbital module. The solar panels span almost 35 feet. The entire capsule serves not only as a crew transport vehicle to and from the station, but also as an emergency return vehicle in the event the crew should have to leave the station unexpectedly. Once launched, the Soyuz will undergo several correction burns using thrusters on the spacecraft to adjust its altitude relative to that of the International Space Station. Back now with another live look at the Soyuz on the launch pad in Baikonur. We are now just 49 minutes and 50 seconds away from the liftoff that's scheduled for 3.31 p.m. Central, 2.31 a.m. Baikonur time. Today's launch will mark the second time that a Soyuz vehicle will dock to the orbiting complex the same day, docking only four orbits or six hours after launch. Just four minutes before today's launch, the International Space Station will fly directly over the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. At the time of launch, the station will be flying at an altitude of about 256 statute miles over southern Russia near the northwest border of Mongolia and will be about 1,336 statute miles ahead of the Soyuz TMA-09M. Launch is precisely time for the moment when the Earth's rotation will place the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the plane of the orbit of the International Space Station. Launch will begin the six-hour rendezvous that will culminate with docking to the inner to the space station's Rafet module at 9.16 p.m. Central Time tonight, 6.16 a.m. Moscow Time, and 8.16 a.m. at the Baikonur Cosmodrome, where Russian and American dignitaries, guests, and family will be watching the events unfold on television. At the time of the Soyuz spacecraft orbital insertion, nine minutes after launch, the station will be about 2,548 statute miles ahead of the rendezvous as it begins. Should a problem occur in the first four hours of the flight, the Soyuz vehicle and its crew could still default to a two-day rendezvous with a docking that would occur in the early evening on May 30.
The crew was awakened at about 7.01 a.m. Central Time this morning, about eight and a half hours prior to launch. The crew members then participated in final pre-launch activities. Before departing for the pad, the three crew members observed a long-standing tradition of autographing the doors to their rooms at the Cosmonaut Hotel in Baikonur Cosmotron. Here's Fyodor Yershikin uh, signing his name yet again. <laughs> followed by uh, Karen Nyberg getting her first uh, ride to the space station on a Soyuz spacecraft, and Luca Parmentano signing his name uh, as he prepares to make his first journey into space for the European Space Agency. Luca? <laughs> Crew members also get a chance to receive a traditional blessing from a Russian Orthodox priest. <laughs> Christ has risen, truly risen. And then at about 9.31 a.m. Central Time today, the crew departed the Cosmonaut Hotel and prepared to board a bus for the ride to the integration and suit-up facility at Building 254 at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. <laughs> Smiles and waves for their uh, friends and uh, co workers gathered there to support their departure. On the left, Luca Pavitano and Setter, Fyodor Shikin, and there's Karen Nyberg on the right of the trio. pulling away from the Cosmos Not Hotel and heading for building 254. They arrived there about 10.16 a.m. Central Time, and then each crew member underwent final medical exams and then suited up in their Sokol launch and entry suits. Suits were pressurized to ensure the integrity of their seals before the crew left for the launch pad. The actual suit-up activities began about 11.01 .01 a.m. Central Time this morning, about four and a half hours prior to launch. A very intricate process of uh, getting situated into these uh, Sokol launch and entry suits. Karen Nyberg, all smiles.
Once the uh, suit up activities were completed and the pressure in the suits was verified to be airtight, the crew then prepared to depart for the launch pad. Here we can see them going through those pressure che checks and uh, mash measurements as they uh, make their final preparations for launch. <laughs> Doug Hurley, the uh, husband of Karen Nyberg, also uh, there to witness her preparations for the departure. And then uh, from behind a protective pane of glass to maintain their quarantine status, crew had a chance to speak to various Russian and NASA managers, friends and family. And a look back here at the Mission Control Center in Houston, Texas, where Royce Renfrew and his team are preparing to support the uh, launch rendezvous and docking activities. Here's a view uh, inside the Soyuz spacecraft as the crew members uh, get situated and prepared for their launch, which is coming up in just 39 minutes and 30 seconds. Karen Nyberg uh, seated to the right of her commander. Uh, and there is that uh, special toy that uh, was mentioned earlier as a talisman for the crew. Again, that's a small toy dog given to Yushikin more than 30 years ago by his high school teacher uh, as a wish for good luck. It'll also serve as the uh, zero gravity indicator and begin floating in the cabin once they achieve orbital status. As we continue to look at these uh, live views inside the Soyuz capsule uh, at Karen Nyberg as she uh, awaits the uh, launch of her Soyuz spacecraft uh, to the International Space Station in uh, just over 36 minutes and 40 seconds from now. We had a chance to speak with the crew members uh, before the flight about their upcoming expedition, their careers preparing for the flight, and what they are most looking forward to. As we count down to launch just a few minutes away, let's hear from the crew in their own words. The new members of the International Space Station's Expedition 36 crew come from three different countries, but share a common trait. Each has wanted to fly in space since childhood. 
Fyodor Yurchikin was born and raised in the Black Sea port city of Batumi in Soviet Georgia, growing up in a time and place where all the children wanted to be cosmonauts, where the winners of kids' games were called Gagarins. Yurchikin wanted to be a part of that life, even if he couldn't be a dashing test pilot. What reason I understood maybe in this day, in this time, then uh, it's maybe in my health, it's not enough to be a cosmonaut, but what is more important for me, be a pilot or be an engineer in space program. Of course, the space program, it was too important for me. So after high school, Yurchikin went to the Moscow Aviation Institute, earned a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, specializing in aerospace vehicles, and went straight to work for the Rocket Space Corporation Energia as an engineer. He worked as a flight controller, and when he became lead engineer for the Mir shuttle program, he spent time at NASA's Johnson Space Center supporting that effort. Yurchikin was selected as an Energia cosmonaut in 1997 and earned a Ph.D. in economics at Moscow Service State University while preparing for his first space flight. He was a member of the STS-112 crew that delivered a piece of the station's starboard truss during Expedition 5 in 2002. He returned five years later on a Soyuz spacecraft as commander of Expedition 15 and made three spacewalks and followed that with two more EVAs as a station flight engineer on Expeditions 24 and 25 in 2010. He believes the station program is paying off in the things we're learning while making the effort, from improving the spacecraft themselves to the tools we develop. But the first big, exactly great sensor for digital cameras, it was factored for this program. And now it's usual for everybody. It's usual for my daughters. It's usual for young boys and girls. I know my profession, it's very important for human. Why I am on this road? Italian Air Force Major Luca Parmitano is from Sicily, born in Paterno and raised in Catania in the shadow of Mount Etna. Although he was very young when he saw the first space shuttles fly on television, he was captivated by the idea of what those images represented. So I remember seeing the, the first astronauts floating around, uh, around the space shuttle doing, doing their job. And I think that even in a kid, as small as I was, I, I just thought that must be the greatest job in the world to be able to do those things and, and, and call it a living. So since then, I, I had the, this dream of becoming an astronaut. Parmitano won a scholarship to spend a year of high school in Southern California. In that year in America, he not only intensified his desire to be a pilot by living with a host family in which the father was a marine navigator, but he met the girl who years later would become his wife. Back in Italy, Parmitano earned a bachelor's degree in political sciences at the University of Naples and graduated from Italy's Air Force Academy, then completed his basic training at the Euro-NATO Joint Jet Pilot Training Program at Shepard Air Force Base in Texas. After six years with a fighter squadron in Italy, he was sent to France to train as a test pilot and earned a master's in experimental flight test engineering at the Superior Institute of Aeronautics and Space in Toulouse in 2009, the same year he was selected for astronaut training by the European Space Agency. Now he's making his childhood dream a reality and fulfilling a desire to push the boundaries of human knowledge. That's who we are. That's what makes us humans. Uh, that is what makes us uh, different from all from the rest of the uh, of, of the animal kingdom. And if we don't follow our of our nature of being explorators, of being thinkers, then we are denying a part of ourselves that is incredibly important. Dr. Karen Nyberg was part of a big family growing up in the tiny town of Vining, Minnesota. And from the time she was a very young girl, she knew she wanted to be an astronaut, although she doesn't know why. She learned some solitary pursuits as a little girl. I've been sewing. My mom taught me to sew when I was probably five or six years old. I've been drawing since I was also that age. I used to, I would never sit in front of the television just sitting there watching TV. I always had a piece of paper and a pencil and was drawing or doodling or doing something. But she took advantage of being in a small town to join more school activities than most kids in big city schools join. I was on the basketball team, the volleyball team, the track team. I took stats for the baseball team. I was in the choir. I was in the band. 
I was in the drama club. I was able to participate in all of them, um, learn to be a team member. She went to the University of North Dakota to study engineering and learned about a program that lets students work at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. Nyberg worked as a co-op in Houston while finishing her bachelor's in mechanical engineering in Grand Forks and while starting her graduate work at the University of Texas at Austin. After she finished a master's and a doctorate in mechanical engineering in Austin, she returned to JSC, working full-time in the Crew and Thermal Systems Division for two years before she was picked for the astronaut program in 2000, where she met her future husband, fellow astronaut candidate Doug Hurley. Nyberg was part of the STS-124 space shuttle crew that delivered the Kibo laboratory module and Japanese robotic arm to the International Space Station in 2008 and was the first person to ever operate the shuttle robotic arm, the main station arm, and the Japanese arm. She's confident this mission will appeal to the adventure seeker in today's kids. I think a, a lot of it is based just on human nature, that we are all very curious people. Um, human beings like challenges, and this is an ultimate challenge. Yeah, this is Mission Control Houston with a look at the Russian flight control room in Kordov, just outside of Moscow, where the team of flight controllers is watching over the Soyuz rocket and its participants as they prepare to launch to the International Space Station. The uh, visiting vehicle officer here in the uh, Mission Control Center in Houston has just informed Flight Director Royce Renfrew that we are 30 minutes until launch. That was a few seconds ago, and so now we are coming up on 29 minutes to launch of uh, Fyodor Yoshikin, Karen Nyberg, and Luca Pamertano to the International National Space Station. Now here's some more of that uh, video from uh, earlier today. As from behind a protective pane of glass to maintain quarantine, the crew spoke to various Russian NASA man managers, friends and family. NASA being represented uh, at Baikonur today by Bill Gerstenmaier, the Associate Administrator for Human Exploration Operations, and Michael Suffardini, the International Space Station Program Manager. They also had a final chance to say uh, farewell to their families and uh, So in English, what's happening now is that the commander is uh, in a lead check on his suit, so he's taking the lead. Uh, they're going to pressurize the suit to make sure that they hold the atmosphere. And then uh, I will do it. All we need is sprinklers and a couple of rocks. When you stretch up, what you say is uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but I'm going to show you guys the choice. We're going to be able to do it.
Again, this is a video that was recorded earlier today as the uh, crew that's getting ready to head to the International Space Station as part of Expedition 36 uh, completed the uh, suit up and getting their final mass measurements recorded uh, prior to their launch. Going through full pressure checks to make sure their uh, spacesuits are in good shape and ready to uh, support them during the journey to orbit. Karen Nyberg here uh, getting a chance to uh, close her visor and get pressure checks. Uh, and of course they also had time behind that glass partition which uh, maintains their quarantine status but allows them also to say farewell to their families and to uh, dignitaries there at the launch site. With all those preparations uh, behind them, the crew left site 254. Uh, they. Uh, Wave farewell to uh, well-wishers as they uh, walk the gauntlet, uh, getting ready to head for the launch pad. <laughs> Nyberg on the left, your chicken in the middle, the taller uh, Parmitano on the right in your picture here. Awaiting the crew's arrival at the base of the Soyuz rocket uh, were well-wishers including Vladimir Popovkin, the head of Roscosmos, who also is the head of the Russian State Commission of Top Space Managers, and Vitaly Lapota, the head of the Soyuz spacecraft design at RSC Energia. And the accomplishment of all the goals set. All the best. Good luck. Thank you. Now, please, wave your hands. Fedor Nikolaevich. And all together, please. Crew members then uh, boarded their bus at about 12.31 p.m. Central Time for the ride out to Launch Pad 1, the Gagarin Launch Pad. And that drive took about 25 minutes, and they arrived at the pad about 12.56 p.m. Central Time. Sir, the leader of the Federal Space Agency, the crew of the Soyuz vehicle, are ready for launch. Fyodor Shikin reporting to Vladimir Popovkin, the head of Roscosmos, and to Vitaly Lapota, the head of the Soyuz spacecraft designed for RSC Energia, that the crew is reporting for duty and ready for launch. Photo. Last photo opportunity before the crew uh, wave goodbye 
and uh, prepared to board the elevator for the ride to the top of the Soyuz rocket. The traditional stairway wave as uh, the crew prepares to board the elevator that will take them to their spacecraft at the top of the Soyuz rocket. As it billows oxygen, after being uh, fueled about three hours prior to launch. Now off you go. One last look at Karen Nyberg as uh, they get the instructions to head for the elevator and to the top of the rocket and their spacecraft. We are now 19 minutes and 30 seconds counting down to the launch of the trio of space explorers who will be heading for the International Space Station later today. A group of NASA representatives is there in Baikonur, just a short distance away from the launch pad. And for an update on the activities there, let's now go to NASA Public Affairs Officer Rob Navius. Rob, go ahead. All eyes are on the launch pad here at the Baikonur Cosmodrome as summer-like weather has descended on Central Asia in the pre-dawn hours of Wednesday. The temperature is around 70 degrees, and to put it in perspective, the temperature at launch time will be almost 100 degrees warmer than it was when the Expedition 35 crew launched in December for its trip to the station. NASA is represented here in Baikonur for today's launch by Bill Gerstenmeyer, NASA's Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations, and Mike Sufferdini, the International Space Station Program Manager. Officials of the European Space Agency are also on hand, led by its Director General, Jean-Jacques Dordain. After launch, officials and family members will gather back in the town of Baikonur at a local military town hall, where a special video feed will be set up to enable us to watch docking and hatch opening. Those activities used to occur at the Russian Mission Control Center for a typical docking two days after launch. But it would take us far longer to fly back to Moscow from here than it will be for the Soyuz crew to reach the space station. So we'll remain in Baikonur throughout the morning to watch the Expedition 36 crew double in size. That's it from a balmy Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. Now back to you, Kelly, at Mission Control in Houston. All right, thanks for that uh, pad side view, Rob, as we get ready for this launch now scheduled for just 17 minutes from now. The Soyuz, uh, of course, now standing ready to launch Karen Nyborg, Fyodor Yershikin, and Luca Pamatana toward their home in space for the next five months. They'll have a very busy time aboard the space station as they welcome a multitude of visiting spacecraft planned for several spacewalks and continue to conduct ongoing research aboard the complex. Let's take a look at what's in, for, in store for this Expedition 36 crew. The International Space Station's Expedition 36 and 37 is an increment filled with visiting vehicles and spacewalks, all on top of a packed agenda of scientific research. 
станция, конечно, сегодня это the ISS today is pretty much the pinnacle of space exploration art, and it shows how many different countries, dozens of countries, engineers, specialists can work jointly on one uh, project and to work reliably. Some of the dozens and dozens of experiments are automated and monitored from control centers on Earth. Others require a helping hand from the laboratory assistants on orbit. Taking care of those human crew members is a top priority. The most important uh, purpose of uh, ISS is to, to learn, to study how people can live in space, how to make their life uh, there more safely, and these crew members are subjects for tests designed to learn exactly how a human body changes during an extended period of time in space. Some of these tests can also have benefits for people who never go to space. For example, there's an experiment called Pro-K. It's a very simple experiment, apparently, uh, where we're going to look how a, a diet can influence uh, uh, the loss of calcium from our bones. Which could have an impact on the treatment of osteoporosis for people on Earth. Another is called Sarcolab. We will be looking at how um, at the sarcomeres, which is it's part of our muscles, how do they work? How do they uh, interact? Uh, what happens to them when uh, they are put in a condition that is different from what they're used to? as in weak due to no gravity to work against, similar to the condition of someone who is bedridden. Another area of concern is ocular health, since it's been discovered that some crew members have been coming home with diminished vision. And it's not known exactly at this time what causes this, but it's an important thing, especially if we're going to be spending longer and longer times, will it get worse as the time goes on? And so they're really starting to do a lot of experiments with us, um, taking images of the retina, taking pressures, uh, looking at your, you know, getting eyesight checks throughout the mission. The station crew is also learning about technology that can have an impact on the ground. For instance, crew members are proving the efficacy of using an ultrasound to examine the spine rather than an MRI. But ultrasound is a very now inexpensive and can come in small briefcase size packaging so that in my opinion would spread to lots of places on this planet that don't have the means and the financial wherewithal to to get this expensive medical equipment among these experiments designed to prepare people for deep space missions in the future are improved countermeasures to fight the bad effects of weightlessness better exercise equipment and protocols that are already making a difference in mitigating bone and muscle loss now on station we have very nice equipment, it's IRET equipment, it's physical training, <laughs> it's like our gym. My second flight, it was a long flight on station in 2007, we don't have IRET, we have uh, ERET, yes, it's more simple, yes, and I know about myself. From 2010 when I used IRET, my physical condition it was more uh, better than on 2007. But that's not all. The station's several laboratories are also hosting research in a range of disciplines that is taking advantage of the lack of gravity. The Italian combustion experiment, Green Air, is one of them. It will uh, study its combustion uh, in order to, uh, to understand how to ameliorate, to make it better, so that the results of combustion, which normally are toxic so substances, how to, to make them uh, either disappear or reduce them to the minimum. A lot of the processes that take place on Earth, as in um, fires, um, combustions of materials, um, solidification of materials, um, flow of liquids, all of that is highly affected by the force of gravity. And all of that, along with Earth observation, technology development, and education, are being studied on this mission. During expeditions 36 and 37, the crews expect to greet most of the cargo vehicles that are keeping the International Space Station supplied. The fourth of the European Space Agency's automated transfer vehicles, the fourth H-2 transfer vehicle from the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, a visit from a Russian progress freighter. 
And we're also hoping that in the period of time that we're there, we'll get the um, vehicle from the Orbital Sciences Corporation, the Cygnus vehicle. It will be, potentially we will get their first demonstration flight. And so that would be very exciting. All of that visiting traffic is scheduled during a very busy period for spacewalks. The EVA frenzy kicks off in late June with veteran spacewalker Yurchikin and first-timer Mazurkin replacing a fluid flow regulator on the Zarya module, testing the station's Coors automated docking system equipment, and removing an experiment from the exterior of Zvezda. In July, there are two spacewalks planned for Cassidy and Parmitano, who will become the first Italian spacewalker in history. The tasks for those EVAs include replacing a failed transmitter receiver box for the space to ground communication system, routing power cables from the U.S. segment to the Russian segment to support a new Russian laboratory module being prepared for launch, retrieving scientific payloads and relocating other hardware. In August, Yurchigin and Mazurkin go back outside twice. First, they'll concentrate on routing those power and data cables from the U.S. segment along the length of Zarya into position at Poisk to later be connected to the new Russian lab. And on the second EVA, they'll install hardware for a new optical telescope and retrieve science experiments. And then crew changes take over. In mid-September, Vinogradov's Soyuz crew departs. Yurchikin assumes command for Expedition 37. And shortly thereafter, he greets the arrival of veteran cosmonaut Oleg Kotov and first-time flyers, astronaut Michael Hopkins and cosmonaut Sergei Razansky. After just six weeks together, they'll all be joined by cosmonaut Michael Turin and astronauts Rick Mastracchio and Koichi Wakata, who arrive only days before Yurchikin, Parmitano, and Nyberg depart for a landing in Kazakhstan to wrap up their on-orbit part of humankind's ongoing effort at exploration. Fifty years from now, we will, we will use uh, the science and the technology that we are creating right now. And, uh, and that's why I'm, I'm proud of the very s small contribution that I will be able to give in, in my six months increment because I think that I will be opening the doors for future generation to be able to go farther away. This is Mission Control Houston, back now with live coverage of the Soyuz spacecraft atop the Soyuz rocket at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. We are now eight minutes and 30 seconds away from the upcoming launch of this trio of spacefarers to the International Space Station. Here's a good view of Karen Nyberg in the Soyuz capsule. Uh, and uh, Fyodor Yushikin is uh, obscured a little bit by the uh, several different stuffed animals that will be used as zero-G indicators. Uh, those are uh, among them gifts from his his uh, daughters and also a gift from his high school teacher that will be used as a talisman for the, uh, the uh, mission that is designated Olympus by its commander. Uh, right now, uh, at the uh, 7 minute 58 second to launch mark, uh, the gyros are in the uncaged position and recorders are being activated. Uh, the pre-launch operations will be completed uh, at the L-7 minute mark in just 45 seconds from now. At uh, 3.25 p.m. Central Time, the final launch down countdown operations will go to auto the launch complex and vehicle systems will be ready for the upcoming liftoff. And here's another look inside the uh, Soyuz spacecraft from another angle. Uh, this shows at the bottom left of your screen uh, Commander Fyodor Yurchikin of the Soyuz vehicle, uh, who will eventually become commander of uh, Expedition 37 aboard the International Space Station. In the upper right-hand corner is Luca Parmitano, the European Space Agency uh, Italian astronaut who's making his first flight to the International Space Station and his first space flight in general.
At this point, uh, we are six minutes and five seconds counting down to launch. And at that L minus six minute point, final launch countdown operations move into their auto sequence. And that means that the launch complex and all vehicle systems are ready for liftoff. At this point, the uh, commander's controls become active and the crew members begin closing their helmets at the L minus five minute mark. And they will insert the launch key. And yes, it is a real launch key in preparation for the final vehicle activation. The ground teams will uh, command that launch key into its start position, commencing the uh, final stages of this countdown to launch. We can see Fyodor Yoshikin uh, toying with the uh, talisman that he brought on board himself and uh, those that his daughter sent with him. At this point in the countdown, the Soyuz first stage steering jets are in the ready to launch position and ground commands have been received from the rocket and they're indicating that all primary and backup systems are ready for launch. Just about a minute ago, the launch control reported that the range at Baikonur is clear and the Soyuz rocket is ready to begin its journey. We're now at the uh, T minus four minute mark and onboard systems have been switched to onboard control. The commander's cockpit displays and, con and controls have been activated and the crew members, as mentioned, are closing their helmets, which putting, puts them on suit oxygen. And we see that they have completed that work and they are on now suit oxygen. Fuel lines and other elements of the rocket engines are being purged with nitrogen to fireproof them by removing vapors and fuels from oxidizers. Now three minutes to launch. At uh, two minutes, 45 seconds to launch, the uh, booster tank is being pressurized for flight. This will optimize the flow of fuel and help add structural support for the rocket with that pressure. And it looks like a beautiful evening at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. As mentioned, about 70 degrees there as uh, spring begins to turn to summer on the steppes of Kazakhstan. At T minus uh, one minute and 30 seconds, the ground propellant feed will be terminated to the spacecraft. Should be happening right about now. T 
T-minus one minute to launch. At this point, the Soyuz is now on internal power, and the auto sequence is starting. The first uh, umbilical tower has been separated from the booster. T minus 45 seconds, the ground umbilical to the third straight stage has been disconnected. The launch command will be issued at T minus 19 seconds. It's about 10 seconds from now. T minus 15 seconds, the second umbilical tower is now separating. 10 seconds, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. And liftoff. Liftoff of Karen Nyberg, Fyodor Yushikin, and Luca Pamitano on a six hour ride to the International Space Station. Good first stage performance. The Soyuz delivering 102 tons of thrust from its four boosters and single engine. The first stage of the Soyuz measures 68 feet in length, 24 feet in diameter, burning liquid fuel for the first two minutes and six seconds of flight. After 30 seconds, all parameters for the Soyuz rocket are nominal. About uh, one minute into the launch, velocity should be 1,100 1, miles an hour. Soyuz blazing into the night sky over Kazakhstan. seconds into the flight and all systems are go. The escape tower has been jettisoned. The four uh, strap-on boosters have been jettisoned and these have completed their job and are going to be dropping away to an altitude of 28 statute miles. The Soyuz traveling at 3,350 miles an hour. Now receiving uh, live views from inside the Soyuz capsule. At the bottom is uh, Fyodor Yushikin. At the top, Luca Pamitano as they monitor the controls of the Soyuz as it climbs into orbit. Shroud jettison has been confirmed. The rocket's altitude now approximately 48 miles tall. Soyuz uh, traveling at approximately 4,700 miles an hour now. Mission Control Moscow reports all parameters are normal. Second stage engines are in normal operation. The Soyuz core stage performing as expected. Uh, it, the core stage is 56 feet in length, 13 and a half feet in diameter, and a single engine with four fuel chambers, providing 96 tons of thrust for its three minutes and 28 seconds of operation. The stage continues to burn until the four minute, 43 second mark. 
The Soyuz uses what's called a hot stage technique. The third stage will ignite while the second is still burning. And that's why the Soyuz has an open area in between the second and third stages. Second stage engine continuing to function normally. And we have a good, good look at Karen Nyberg inside the spacecraft. At four minutes and 43 seconds, the third stage will ignite, and the second stage will begin shutting down. Mission Control Moscow reports all systems normal. Second stage separation com confirmed. The third stage is igniting. Karen Nyberg waving as the flight continues to go nominally. Now five minutes and 30 seconds following launch, the Soyuz is being propelled by the single engine of the Soyuz's third stage, that engine providing 30 tons of thrust, burning for four minutes and two seconds. Visiting vehicle officer reporting to flight director Royce Renfrew that third stage engines are all nominal. Six and a half minutes since launch, all systems still normal. Mission Control Moscow reporting that the roll, pitch, and yaw control thrusters are all functioning well as the crew continues its climb into orbit. Third stage engine uh, and it continues to op operate normally. Seven minutes and 30 seconds since launch, the spacecraft speed is almost 13,500 miles an hour. Once this third stage delivers the Soyuz to orbit and the module is separated, a series of pre-programmed commands will be executed to prepare the Soyuz for its orbit operations. These stored commands, called time tag commands, allow many of the Soyuz's systems to be automatically activated by onboard computers at precise times stored in those computers. Eight minutes into the flight, all systems normal. Eight and a half minutes since the launch from the Baikonur Cosmodrome's launch pad number one, Soyuz rocket and spacecraft continue to function as planned. At eight minutes and 45 seconds, coming up just now, the third stage will cut off and separate. The single liquid-fueled engine will have shut down and drop away at an altitude of about 125 statute miles.
Visiting vehicle officer here in Mission Control reports to Flight Director Royce Renfrew that third stage separation has been confirmed. The Soyuz capsule and crew inside are now safely in orbit, and the spacecraft is automatically executing its pre-programmed commands to deploy the antennas and solar arrays. All antennas and solar arrays have been confirmed deployed and functioning well. The Soyuz is orbiting now at an altitude of 143 miles by 118 miles. That orbit will be raised systematically over the course of the next six hours, placing it in close proximity to the International Space Station. The crew inside the Soyuz spacecraft all smiles as they continue their journey to the International Space Station. The uh, control of the spacecraft from here on will be overseen from the Russian Mission Control Center outside of Moscow and Korolev. And this is a view of the Neptune panel inside the Soyuz spacecraft as the uh, crew, co particularly Commander Fyodor Yershikin, continues to monitor the performance of the spacecraft as it continues its climb into orbit. All of the uh, characters you see here are Cyrillic, uh, uh, Russian language characters that are showing him precise levels of uh, performance for the Soyuz spacecraft. This is mission. This is Mission Control Houston. Now, 13 and a half minutes since the uh, Soyuz spacecraft uh, launched to the International Space Station. All three crew members, Commander Fyodor Yershikin, uh, NASA astronaut Karen Nyberg, and European Space Agency astronaut Luca Parmentano, uh, safely on their way toward the International Space Station, and a link up uh, a little bit later tonight. All systems on the spacecraft performing well.
we're standing by to uh, bring you the launch replays, uh, but continue to bring you the live view from the Mission Control Center in Karlov outside of Moscow. On board the orbiting outfit outpost, uh, three space flyers looking forward to the uh, completion of the Expedition 36 crew as uh, Commander Paul Vinogradov, NASA astronaut Chris Cassidy, and Russian flight engineer Alexander Mazurkin uh, continue their duties and uh, prepare for the arrival of the trio that will round out their six-person crew for the next several months. This is Mission Control Houston. Uh, we will uh, now begin preparation to show you the launch replays of the uh, Expedition 35 launch from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. All systems work very well. The launch went exactly according to plan, lifting off at 3.31 p.m. Central Time as the team here in Mission Control Houston, led by Royce Renfrew, the flight director, and Kate Rubens, the spacecraft communicator, monitored the progress of the vehicle and the crew as they lifted off from the Baikonur Cosmodrome Gagarin Pad launch pad number one. We'll be sending the uh, signal out for launch replays, but just a reminder, there's a lot yet to come tonight as we continue coverage of the Expedition 36 uh, Soyuz uh, cruise launch and docking events. Uh, we'll begin our uh, post-launch video file at uh, 6 p.m. Central Time. Uh, and then uh, at 8.30 p.m., we will resume our coverage with Soyuz TMA-09M docking coverage. That uh, docking scheduled for 9.16 p.m. Central Time. And then we'll be back for further coverage with the Soyuz hatch opening at 10.30 p.m. with hatch opening officially scheduled for 10.55, followed by welcoming ceremonies as uh, Commander Pavel Vinogradov, uh, uh, Chris Cassidy, and Alexander Mazurkin welcome their new trio of crew members into the orbiting outpost, conduct brief welcoming ceremonies, and go off for a safety uh, discussion with the new crew members, making sure everybody knows uh, where they need to be in the event of an emergency. At 11.30 p.m., we will have the post-docking news conference replay. And then uh, tomorrow uh, at 1 a.m. Central Time, we'll have a video file of the Soyuz docking and hatch opening activities. With that, we will close out our show here from Mission Control Houston for now, but we'll be back for more coverage of this single day to orbit launch and rendezvous for the Expedition 36 crew members as they begin their journey of exploration aboard the International Space Station. This is Mission Control Houston.
I worked a long time at the eight foot high temperature tunnel at Langley making modifications there to burn liquid oxygen and high pressure methane in a big high pressure combustor and first time that lit off was a really sweet moment. Another great moment was the drive system we put in NTF, the National Transonic Facility. That was about 15 years ago and it's still the largest drive system in the world today. NASA uses wind tunnels for a lot of purposes that are very important to the nation. We do things like improve the efficiency of aircraft, we make uh, the airplanes safer, we test engines for thrust improvements, for better fuel economy. NASA is a place for great opportunity. We have so many areas of science and exploration and technical fields that are so rich and rewarding for individuals to participate in. I, I grew up in rural Virginia on a farm, and for me to have a career at NASA is exceptional.